Welcome to another edition of Journey of Hope. Thrilling stories of real people going through the journey of life. Many of us wake up one day and we go through life and uh, as the psalmist says, today is the day of the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. And people go along through life and all of a sudden they encounter some kind of traumatic accident or injury or event in their life that changed their life forever. Other people are born into a world where from the very beginning they face all kinds of challenges. Such is the story of my friend Judy. Judy Squire is from Grants Pass, Oregon and has an amazing story and a journey that she's been on. Wherever she goes, she blesses people. Judy, it's good to have you here. What a joy. And we're looking forward to this interview. I know that people around the world are watching. And so just for our listening audience, tell us a little bit about your background, where you came from, and how things got started. Well, it started on March 4th, 1945. A little baby was born and no ultrasound in those days, so no one was prepared for the malformation of her lower limbs. And the doctor blurted out to my father, your daughter's going to live, I'm sorry to say. He said, I'm sorry that your daughter's going to live. I'm sorry. It's going to be a rough road, Reverend Ryder. So, so that was Your the... father was a pastor, okay? And the first news he gets, I'm sorry that your daughter's going to live. Because what happened at birth? I was, I had incomplete legs, so I had no knees, no thighs. I just had little stubs, and one foot had two toes, and the other had three. And so it was a shocker to see such deformity. And the doctor said, take, uh, no, the doctor said, actually put her in an institution. And my parents said, we're going to take her home and love her. Wow. So from the very beginning, they were there, and you're right, no ultrasound, no sign of warning, no, no, no way of knowing what kind of a baby it was going to be, a male or a female. And then it comes out, and no legs, and any other difficulty, any other challenges at that point? It was a deformed left hand, and um, so it had webbed, a webbed two fingers here, and Shriners Hospital did all the reconstruction. And so my reverend of a father, didn't, they didn't have a lot of income, so Shriners saved the day and took me on as a patient, at, as an infant, and did all the surgeries, bought the artificial limbs, and... Um, well, I've was... heard a lot about the Shriners, but I haven't had much contact with them, but they were a very instrumental part in your early life then and making an impact upon your family, your mother and your father. So he was right. a pastor. And were you the first child or the second child? Or? I was second. You were the second. So I had a sister three years older, and that way my parents knew what, what I should be doing at the next stage of development. So my sister Tina was um, the trailblazer, and Dad made sure I tried everything she did, though I couldn't do a lot of it. Now, so, did, uh, uh, did they have any kind of prosthetics made for you? I mean, They when had metal stilts made for me initially, and then at age 10, they amputated those, artif those deformed feet and fit me with artificial limbs. So you had little short legs with feet on them, okay? And uh, how you were 10 years old, so how were you getting along between the time you started crawling and started walking? I could walk and run on those little feet. Could you? And, um, but I stayed short. And so Shriners um, designed some stilts so that I'd have height. And I could walk and run on those. So too. they were stilts, but they had feet like a pod or something? They, they just had a leather square base, and then my foot was in an orthopedic shoe. Actually, in one of these orthopedic shoes, it was riveted to the metal stilt. Oh. So okay. it was at knee level. Uh-huh. And then the rest was metal and leather. So that was hooked up really on the top of the stilt then? Right. Yeah, okay. So this was at the age of 10, they finally decided to go ahead, and were you a part of that decision then? I don't think I was, but my parents and the prosthetist from Chicago made it sound so wonderful that I said, I want to do that. Sounds good to you. Okay. So 
was your uh, was your father, you know, favoring you because you had been born this way, or was he? My father took me on as his mission project. Did he? He totally dedicated himself to me being able to try everything. And so his goal in my life was for me to be able to walk and to have normal looking legs and to um, go away to college and get married and all these things, but they didn't expect it when I was a newborn. So, but the dreams begin to gradually develop. Okay, so now, did, what time did you start school? Did you start school at a regular time, or were you I held went, back? Or? I went to a special school at age five, and then we moved, and I was in a experimental classroom. And the teacher later said it was a failure as an experiment. We had one teacher and disabled children who were third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. All in one class. All in one class, no aids. So I came out not very smart from that setting. And how long were you in there? That was through th um, eighth grade. Through the eighth, then through I, the eighth grade, okay. Through the eighth grade, then I went into the um, regular high school, and then I went to the University of Illinois for six years and got my master's but in now, speech But now, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. You're, wah, wah, you're wah. getting all the way to college. So I'm trying to figure out, you got your, eight, your, your legs at age 10. Now, did they develop over, did they get longer and, and as, as you grew up? Um, I didn't get taller, but I, at age 13, got a second set because my body had changed. At 18, another set. So up until age 60, I had seven sets, and then I retired them and am a full-time wheelchair user for the past 10 years. Well, I know the first time I saw you come in with a wheelchair, we were there at the hospital, and we're, you were there for a different reason because of your husband. I had no idea. I thought you had just had some kind of accident. In fact, as you came in, I didn't realize that you were without legs. So you finished high school. Now, where did you go to high school? In Berwyn, Illinois. Okay, and then when you graduated, you were planning on going on to college. And what did you want to do? I didn't know. So I wheeled the halls of the dorm and asked people what they were majoring in and what, if they liked it. So that's how I ended up in speech pathology. And you got graduated, got a degree in speech pathology. Okay. Then after graduation, what are you going to do? What were your plans? Um, the month I graduated was the month David Squire married me. And graduated so, and got married at the same time. So an MS degree and an MRS degree. And an M the same weekend. Well, almost. Almost. And then on, on our wedding night, I flew out to California and lived there for almost 40 years. So was he from California? He had a job we in California? We were both from Illinois. You're both from Illinois. But he had a job and I had a he job. He was working in the space industry then. Right. So and you had a job doing what? I had a job um, as a speech pathologist at Stanford. At Stanford, okay. So you moved out here, you got married. I mean, how in the world did you ever meet David? And it's, he was a gift from God. Our parents knew each other before we were born. Oh, really? And so they stayed in touch. And so as our paths caught, crossed again in college, um, we started dating. Now, were you in college at the same place? Mm -hmm. The same place. So David knew exactly everything that he was getting, the whole package. Oh, right. yeah. The whole package. So you got married. And then shortly after you married, you moved out to California, to Stanford. Okay, and he was working in the space industry. At Lockheed Martin. At Lockheed Martin. Okay, so tell us a little bit what you've been doing now, because you've developed a whole ministry. Tell us about uh, Judy and well, Joni. Johnny and Judy. Yeah. Um, and Jesus, because can't do life without Jesus. Well, after 10 years as a speech pathologist, we started a family. So you so decided to have a family, okay? We, we had three daughters. They all had long, strong legs. These were your own children now, Our not adopted. Own, right. And um, so that took a lot of years. Well, I can imagine you had three daughters. You were married for 10 years, and then you decided to go ahead and, ha and have some children. So one, I mean, every, every couple of years were you having children? We had three daughters 
in five years. You didn't want to waste too much time then, did you? No. Well, I started late. Right, so you got to try to get caught up. So how in the world did you raise three daughters with some of the unique challenges that you have? I say the angels collapsed in bed at night because <laughs> it was a team approach. And as soon as a little child starts walking, they can become a servant. Oh, and, I and see. And so run and help the other child or um, carry in groceries or pick mom up off the floor. So I had one on each arm and one pushing from, the, from in back. And we had a song I'd sing. May I borrow your legs? I have need of them. Mine don't work so well. So motherhood was definitely a team approach. My, so you've been married 10 years, and in the next five years, you had three new babies born in the so family. So they're all grown up, and now we have five grandchildren. And are they scattered around? There, um, two will be in Oregon with us, and the other still in the Bay Area. Okay. So now, how did you get involved in a ministry? Well, I was born into the disability ministry. But I... Well, born, not everybody that's born with disability becomes a ministry. Yeah, I did try to run from it. I did not want to be associated with broken people until Johnny Erickson Tata changed my viewpoint. She, she wrote something that said, people with disabilities are God's best visual aids to demonstrate who he really is. Now, not everybody knows who Johnny is, so tell us who oh, he is. Oh, Johnny is um, an icon in the world. She represents disabled people with a purpose and disabled broken people set free. And she dove into Chesapeake Bay at age 17 and came out of that um, water with quadriplegia. So Billy Graham was one of her supporters and, and she became known through his ministry and then she started her own, Johnny and Friends. Now she's had some books and some artwork. 45. 45 She's written 45 books. books. And how does she write? I mean, she's a quad, so how, do, how does she do that? She has helpers, she has assistants. Okay. And she also can use a computer. I don't know if it's with a joystick on her forehead or what, but that girl is prolific. And she's done some painting? Painting with a um, brush, in, brush her in her mouth. mouth. Wow. So she has changed people's perspective about brokenness. So you got acquainted with her. Now are you working with her and for her? In fact, you're down here in Southern California now in a, in a program down in the San at Diego. At a family or... retreat at Murrieta Hot Springs. And who, who's coming together there? It is 49 families touched by disability will arrive today. And there are about 75 teenagers um, primarily who are called short-term missionaries. And they will be supporting the family this week. And there will be Bible study. There will be square dance. There will be talent shows with children who've never been on stage. Well, this must be quite an event. It's, it's life-changing. Well, I imagine it is. For, uh, and those teenagers that are being involved, it's got to change them forever. It will. Yeah, it really does. Now, you were honored here a few years ago back in the Washington, D.C. area. What happened? It was, was it was when I was a full-time mom feeling like, who am I kidding? How can I, without legs, do this legs job called motherhood? So I was feeling this tall. And God sees us and knows where, where we are emotionally. And so I say, El Elyon, the Most High God, said, hop on my shoulders. I'm going to show you your significance so I got a phone call from Washington, D.C., from Family Research Council. And they said, Judy, we're having our annual banquet this year, and we will be, dis we will be honoring three disabled Americans, and you are one of them. Really? So they said, we're flying your family to Washington, D.C., and we they gave me a 15-pound bronze statue about... Um, about strengthening the American family. 
Wow. And I, I felt like I was a weakling in the American family, but God gave me the honor of being publicly dis declared a strengthener. This was a national event, wasn't it? Yeah, and I, I saw one of the videos that was produced from that. So now, what are you doing now? I mean, uh, David is retired. David's retired. And so he's able to go with you now. And we travel, and, and when we moved to Oregon, I became a recluse and, and wrote books. You did, and I see we got a couple of them here. So what books, what was your first book? I think this that was one. the first one. His Majesty and Brokenness. His Majesty and Brokenness. What is this book about? It's about how we are all broken. We human beings, we may look so together, but we all have a weakness, a brokenness. And so that gold shoe is was my orthopedic shoe that God turned gold. His majesty met me in the brokenness and through experiences, through reading the word, I realized that I had great significance. So I wrote stories about how his majesty showed up in my exclusion as a child, in the uphill climb of motherhood, and how he basically when we are at the end of our rope and we shout help, then he can begin his masterpiece. So how did he show his majesty in your motherhood? El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God, was the one that enabled me to do legs job even though I was on artificial limbs or legless. And the song El Shaddai, Michael Card's song, my favorite line is that God's most awesome work was done through the frailty of his son. And it's in our frailty when we are humble enough or helpless enough to say, is anyone up there? <laughs> that God can touch our lives and companion with us. Now, many, many people cry out and they're not sure that God hears them. And what are you saying? Well, I'd say during my childhood and teen wilderness years, I wondered if he heard me. But I guess don't quit before the happy ending is what I say. It's there not over. There is a guaranteed happy ending in Christ. That's right. We know how the story ends. Yay. That's right. We know who wins. What's this other book that you've written? The other book is about 18 Hebrew names of God, El Shaddai, Jehovah Jireh and how God intercepts our life and he he empowers us not only empowers us he companions with us in the rough places in the impossibilities and we develop a love relationship with him so all these different names are different aspects of God Okay, and as, do you have a chapter for each one of the names? Then? I do. And do you have some experiences about each Personal one? Personal experiences, other people's experiences. And in both books, it ends with, what about you? I don't want people to read my story and say, that's nice, and they go help on. Her. It worked for Judy, but no, God I want know I mine. want them to be introspective and to figure out how God has, has shown up on their timeline, not just once, but daily, hourly. Well, when you go and speak, and suppose you're speaking on the names of God in a group, how do you help them personalize that? I think telling them stories helps them see that it can be personal. Identify with it. And then identifying what that name means. Jehovah Jireh means that I will provide for whatever you need. And so you explain who he is and what it's all about and that he personally wants to be part of your life to empower, enable, to equip you by his resurrection power. Well, when you came down here to Loma Linda a few years ago with David because he was being treated for a, a, a cancer that he had, uh, which name were you calling out to then? 
Jehovah Rapha is God the healer. I, um, and we were um, entrusting David's treatments to Jehovah Rapha, the great physician. But he surprised me because when I arrived in the Loma Linda lobby, there were pictures of Jesus on duty in surgery, in the examining room. And, and I don't know if people can see this picture, but there is a little child hospitalized. The mother or a doctor is sitting on the bed and Jesus is standing beside the bed. So when Lynn Martell led his, his group meeting that day and we all went around and we told who we are, I couldn't wait to tell him that coming to Loma Linda, I saw for the first time a tangible Jesus Christ on duty, even way back in Shriners when it looked so hopeless and God, I don't think you're hearing me but he was there all, all along, Jehovah Shama. So some of those pictures by Nathan Green. Oh, I love them. <laughs> I just went What did and, it do for you? It just was, it was, our faith is, um, it's a hope that God is there. This was the proof that God was there. And it, it, I just went right into those pictures as a little girl, as um, the one on the operating table, and to see. You saw yourself, I, the whole story <sighs> coming through, and uh, it was revealed to you. Well, I know how excited you were when you saw those pictures because, you know, you know when you see something that's so exciting, you can't keep it yourself, and you were sharing. Yeah. So when you go around and you have your workshops, and I know you've been traveling around and you're talking, sharing your books, and are you working on another book? I would like to write something for children, but I also would like to help people figure out where God shows up in their life story and how he shows up in his different names. And I, the lady with, without legs want to teach people how to write their legacy. Their legacy. Their legacy. <laughs> right. And I even want to help them write their memorial services because our last words are lasting words. And that's my last chance to declare, can't do life without God. Life is difficult. Jesus shows up. Okay, how look into the cameras. There's your camera there. How, how he shows us his wonderful cross in our brokenness. This is my broken hand. And one day I was in Romania teaching um, moms with disabled children to hope in Christ. And my hand popped off my lap. Three-point sermon, it said, here it comes. Can't do life without God. Life is difficult. Jesus shows up. And when I got home, I looked at that hand and I thought it's the three-pronged cross of Jesus Christ that will always show up in our brokenness. Always, that's right. So you got a continual symbol that you're carrying around with you. <laughs> and and you're able to turn that into a blessing by sharing it with others. And it's dangerous. <laughs> it is dangerous. People don't know what to hide from when it pops up. <laughs> well, what are your plans for the future? The plans for the future would be more grandchildren, um, learning to be a loving, supportive wife to my husband, who's been loving and supportive to me for David 47 years. David is an years. amazing, amazing individual. I know. Now, when did he retire? How many years ago? He retired about 10 years ago. So, but he's been able to travel with you, and he's very special. I mean, to think that he chose you and then had a family, and I can only begin to imagine what kind of a, a special person he is. And the blessing that he was to the, you and to the girls. And now you have how many grandkids? Five. Five. And you say one of your goals is to have more. I hope they're included in that. Yes, and, and just to be available to those grandkids. And I went to one of their kindergarten classes and was a rock star. 
Yeah, I was were. a rock star. Oh, I'm sure I you mean, were. I went in fear and trembling, thinking one of them's going to say, What happened to you? They just said, Oh, can we push you in your wheelchair? Can we name your wheelchair? Will you come back? They so loved, they I loved am, you then. I'm in my Jubilee season so, of my life. The beginning was hard. But now it's good. Well, I think you need to do something for the kids. It's obvious that the kids had a special liking to you. And to come up with some kind of a book where you could talk about some of these names and bring it down and onto their level. Right. Now, we have people all around the world that are listening to this, and some have just been confronted with some sobering news. What would you tell them? Look into the camera. What would you tell them? My hand says it all. Whatever your sobering news... You can't face it without God. Can't do life without God. Yes, you have sobering news and you aren't sure how you'll get through it. He is with you. Jesus shows up. You are not alone. And a verse that my parents um, could vaguely hear through all of their questions and their struggle was Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, I know the plans I have for you. They're plans to prosper you and not to harm you. They're plans with a future and a hope. So you too have that future and a hope. Jump up on Jesus' shoulder or jump on his lap and let him companion with you through what looks impossible. God is going to take you all the way. And Judy is a wonderful example of someone who born with insurmountable challenges, but she's lived up to it. And she's trusted in God. And you too, if you'll look to him, he'll open and close doors that his will will reveal to you. God bless you. Look to him just now. <laughs>